what is God? Even if you don't believe in God, you have some idea associated with this word. And ideas matter. People's ideas about God have caused the most horrific acts of war and violence. People's ideas about God have also inspired the most unbelievable acts of love. The discipline I work and study in is theology. Theology is particularly interested in ideas about God. It is the study of God. However, the way theology has been done for the past 1,000 years, it has been very focused on words and become a method that is primarily discursive, argumentative, seeking to be right, to prove someone wrong, and looking for definitions. This method is often taught by instructors who are seen as holding all of the knowledge, and they then deposit this in their students. The students echo it back through essays and papers through words. While this has done a lot of good for theology, it also has created a lot of division amongst people around ideas about God. So what if we did theology another way? What if we did theology in a way that was collaborative and sought dialogue? I think there is another way, and I call it art theology. Art theology uses the creative languages of the arts to explore ideas and questions about God in a way that creates dialogue, collaboration, connection, and expands our ideas about love. This idea first came to me when I was studying for my master's in theology in Baltimore, Maryland. One weekend, I was reading the Baltimore Sun, and there was an article about a new exhibit at the Walters Art Museum, Archimedes Codex. They'd found a new codex of Archimedes in a prayer booklet and lifted it out. There was one line that the journalist said that struck me so intensely, I went that day to go see the exhibit. The journalist had written, Archimedes thought in diagrams. And when I saw Archimedes' codex, I immediately thought of Leonardo da Vinci. Both of them have words and images all intermingled on their pages. And for me, who grew up in the 80s, <laughs> looking at this, I kept thinking about how I was always told to never doodle in my notebooks and to adhere to very strict outlines. And that night, I kept wondering, what would it be like to think in diagrams? A couple days later, I was in the theology class, and we were talking about sin, all those things that you do wrong, the things that cut you off from God, others, love, yourself. That day, we were focusing on the Christian concept of original sin, the sin you're born with. As I was listening to the lecture, I could feel this question emerging in me, but I couldn't find the words to wrap around it. And then I thought of Archimedes, and I started to draw. What I drew was this very simple tree. <laughs> but as I drew the lines from the roots of that tree, up through the trunk into the branches and the fruit, and back down again, I found my question, and it astonished me. What if sin isn't all bad? What if we haven't been looking at it completely? We've been so focused on defining sin and judging what things are good and bad. Maybe we've missed something that's even more there in the roots. As I drew into those roots, I discovered a passion for social justice, a longing for community. And as I drew even deeper in the roots, I found underneath all of it was a desire for love. But if we don't know how to cultivate the fruit, the seeds within us, we end up with fruit that we don't want. This simple tree and drawing it and the question that it took me into not only transformed my ideas about sin, it completely transformed my ideas about God. If God does not exist, the thing that we all long for and want, the thing that drives all of us is love. If God does exist, the essence of that being is love. But either way, our ideas of love are so shallow. So I sought through art theology to expand my idea of love. I first turned to theologians, and there the best I could find were arguments, again, for beauty. People were arguing about how we know God through beauty, but no one was looking at how do we know and how do we know differently through creating art. Then I discovered two abstract painters, Hilma Ofklint and Vasily Kadinsky. 
Both of them, they are considered the mother and father of abstract art, and both of them saw it through color and line to say something new about the spiritual that hadn't been said in words. And this led them to abstraction. Now, many people, they don't understand abstract art. That's what they'll share with me, that they feel uncomfortable about it. They don't know what it's about. And I tell them, I understand. I used to feel the same way until I understood what these two abstract painters were after. And I started to realize that realistic art works on us in a way that's very similar to the way that definitions work on us in theology. Let me give you an example. Most people will look at realistic art and they think right away, they know what it's about and they move on. They think it's a couple in the park, it's the Last Supper. They think that the subject is easily identifiable and they move on. An art historian will tell you there's so much more going on. They could tell you the story that was being depicted. They could tell you what the artist was doing with color and light. But most people don't stop to have that conversation. Just like in theology, a theologian will tell you that a definition does not capture the whole of what they're saying about God. But most people don't stop to have that conversation with the theologian. They hear the definition, they come to their conclusion, and they move on. Abstract painting creates dialogue. It works in a completely different direction than definitions. When people see abstract paintings, they want to hear what other people think about it. They want to share what their perceptions are. It creates dialogue, which is why it works so great in art theology. <laughs> now, art theology uses all sorts of creative languages, but today I'm going to focus on color and line because it was these two painters, Helma Offklint and Vasily Kadinsky, who inspired this method. Kadinsky wrote a whole book called On the Spiritual in Art, but he doesn't give you quite the in into understanding his artwork the way that Helma Offklint does. Helma wrote volumes and volumes of notebooks that work like a lexicon to her work. She talks about how blue symbolized the feminine, yellow symbolized the masculine, different letters that she used and what they symbolized. Inspired by Helma, I created a method where I would have workshop participants and students create their own color and line lexicons. I'd have them write out what different colors meant to them, what different lines meant to them. And then I would give them questions and ideas about God and love and invite them to respond through color and line. Now, the biggest resistance I hear to this method <laughs> from theologians as well as students and workshop participants is that not everybody's an artist, to which I say, the point isn't to be a great artist. The point is to think differently. Just as we teach students in theology to write papers not all of those students are great at writing papers. Some are, but not all. But what they all have to do is they have to learn the basic components to write an essay, to write a paper. We can teach the basic components of creative languages just as easily. So what does this look like? We could start with this question. What is your first idea about God? This might not be your idea today. This is not your idea at a big revelatory moment, this is the very first time you can remember being introduced to the idea of God. It might not even be a clear instance. It might just be a feeling or an intimation. But as best you can, try to remember it. Now give it a color. What color would you use to symbolize that first idea? Whenever I do this with workshop participants and students, we have the most incredible conversations. They paint their color, and then we end up in this terrific dialogue. I share with them that my first idea I symbolize with gray. And I always want to know why. <laughs> what we don't do, though, is we don't argue about whose color is right or wrong. We end up talking about the good and the bad that those colors symbolize, all the muddy middle, and we end up with a fantastic dialogue. I share with them that I choose gray because I know that somewhere in there, this first image of an old man up in the sky with a long gray beard is there, sitting on clouds. The, the clouds were gray, the beard was gray, but more than that, this idea of a mystery was introduced to me. This mystery that seemed at times cold and distant, and also I was taught that this mystery loved me unconditionally. And so there was this warmth in the gray as well. The next question we could ask is, when did your idea of God first change? 
Did someone teach you something? Did someone take you to a place of worship? Did you hear something in the news that caused your idea of God to change? Now, how would you symbolize that with a new color and now a line? Sometimes students will go back to their first painting, that first idea of God, and they will say that the change is so significant, they will completely cover the canvas. They know that first color is there, but this new idea that they were introduced to completely overshadows it. Others will just add a simple circle in the bottom right-hand corner to say, it was significant, but it just added something to my initial idea of God. For me, I symbolize it with this brown abstract line. The gray remains, it softens a bit, but this abstract line symbolizes for me how I was introduced to the idea that love is personal through Jesus. Now, at times, the way that I was taught this, I felt I knew Jesus so well that I'd rested my head on that shoulder, that I knew the nook in that neck. And yet, if you asked me what his eyes look like or his nose or his smile, I couldn't tell you. In some ways, it's like I don't know him at all. Now, I tell students all the time, it's important to pay attention to what comes up as we're painting these. For me, as I painted those first two paintings, these questions began surfacing about why my ideas about God were so masculinely gendered. And then I sought new dialogue partners. <laughs> I wanted to expand my ideas about God, explore those questions, and I sought other people in other faith traditions. Not to compare, not to argue, but to expand my idea of love. First, in wrestling with that idea, that question about how could God be gendered and what do women then image in themselves if they are made in the image of God? As I wrestled with this, I turned to Judaism and the idea of Shekinah, the divine feminine. In Hebrew scriptures, what Christians call the Old Testament, there are metaphors for God that talk about God as a woman in labor, a woman giving birth, and nursing. As I reflected on this, and I wrestled with those questions that had surfaced in me, I found myself reaching for new colors and new lines. I was reaching for blues and purples and the, the gold, and then I found myself creating these undulating lines. And as I painted this painting, I realized that if there is a truly a God, it is this being that is female, male, non-binary, fluid like water. It is a being that is beyond gender and beyond our comprehension. And we can experience and create love, all of us, regardless of bodily function, can create love that conceives, gestates, births, labors, and nourishes one another. Next, I turn to Islam. And in particular, I went to the Sufi poets, the mystics of Islam. And as I read their poetry, I kept thinking about how the adjectives I would use to describe their relationship with God, most people don't use those adjectives to talk about their ideas about God. Those adjectives are very similar to the adjectives I would use to describe the Song of Songs and Hebrew scriptures. Those different works of poetry are passionate, they're tender, they're ecstatic, they're intimate and sensual. And as I painted this painting, I kept thinking about how love shows up in those ways in our lives in so many, so many different ways, and yet we don't give it enough thought. We tend to only use those adjectives to talk about our sexual relationships. And yet, there are ways that it should show up in other relationships. We want more passion, we want more tenderness with one another. Next, I turn to Hinduism and the idea of Brahman. This idea of Brahman is the divine ground of being. From Brahman, their first three gods spring, and from them, all the other gods. The divine ground of being is what we all come from. It nourishes us. And as I was reflecting on this idea about God, I kept thinking about the paradox of love, how it is constant, and I captured that with the browns, constant and fertile and unchanging, and yet, it is constantly growing, constantly deepening. This paradox in love is constantly erupting with that molten gold life. My ideas of love have, through art theology, through color, line, music, sound, and texture, my idea of love has become so 
so meaningful to me and so vast and expansive, it has become the most important idea of my life. If there is a God, it has to be this love, this love that is mysterious, personal, intimate, constant, dynamic, creative, unchanging, fluid, male, female. It is constantly expanding. I encourage you all to think about your ideas about God and love through the creative languages that you feel drawn to. And the next time someone wants to argue about their ideas about God, ask them what they've learned about love from their idea about God. And the next time you're tempted to judge someone, I invite you to reflect and look a little bit deeper. Look deeper at how that person is reaching for love or to love. And let us help one another to constantly grow in love and expand our ideas about God. Just like the universe is constantly expanding, let us seek to constantly expand our ideas about love through art theology. Thank you.